Supracondylar fracture of the humerus, the pulseless hand. Vascular compromise in displaced supracondylar humerus fractures can be present in up to 20% of patients, usually due to brachial artery injury. Fracture displacement may cause injury to the surrounding soft tissues, including the brachial artery and the radial or the median nerve, with reported incidence as high as 50%. Complete median nerve injury deficit is a predictive of brachial artery injury. In extension injury, the anterior osseous nerve can be injured and the child will not be able to do the OK sign. Inflection type injury and under nerve injury may occur. The patient may get an under nerve palsy. Brachial artery can be stretched or kinked over the displaced fracture fragments. It can be tethered by the ulnar-sided supratrochlear branch of the brachial artery. Nerve injuries in general can occur in about 10 to 20% of supracondylar humeral fractures. It is usually a traction neuropraxia and that will improve with time so you will do observation for the patient. Due to anatomic proximity of the median nerve to the brachial artery, injury to one structure may predict injury to the other. A median nerve injury in displaced supracondylar humeral fracture may suggest vascular injury as well as a pulseless limb. The physician should perform a careful neurovascular exam in patients with supracondylar humeral fractures. In the initial exam, the physician should establish if there is a nerve injury and if there is a distal pulse Usually, the radial pulse is palpated, and if the hand is pink, so you want to see if there is a nerve injury, if there is a distal pulse, and if the hand is pink. Examination findings of the injured extremity should be compared with the other side, the non-injured side. Supracondylar humeral fractures with an absent radial pulse and a median nerve injury should raise a suspicion for an associated vascular injury. How do you assess the vascular status? Check the radial artery, the hand color, the temperature and edema, capillary refill compared to the other side, pain level. If there is an increase in analgesic requirement, that may indicate the development of a compartment syndrome. It is generally accepted that arterial capillary refill should be less than 2 seconds, and this should be compared with the other side. Prolonged arterial capillary refill, pulselessness, diminished digital pulp temperature, cooler hand temperature, pallor, and severe upper extremity edema may be signs of poorly perfused limb. What are the other clinical findings suggestive of vascular injury? High energy injury, anticubital ecchymosis, puckering of the anterior skin. When there is displaced fracture, we got to be suspicious of the development of compartment syndrome. There is a high incidence of compartment syndrome with type 3 fractures. In type 3 fractures, the volar forearm compartment pressures are on an average 5 to 19 mm mercury higher than those of type 2 fractures. If the limb is disvascular for greater than 6 hours, prophylactic volar compartment release should be done. 
Some believe that prophylactic fasciotomy should be done if there is a vascular injury that requires repair. We should attempt to improve the position of all displaced subracondylar fractures of the humerus. You will need to do gentle traction and flex the elbow from 30 to 45 degrees and immobilize the elbow in a posterior splint. This maneuver may improve the position of the fracture and may restore the pulse and improve the circulation and the perfusion of the hand with very little risk of causing harm to the patient. Do not flex the elbow excessively because it can impair the circulation even more. Signs of distal ischemia are usually a cool, pale hand. If you have a pulseless, poorly perfused limb after gentle traction in a splint, then you will need to do emergency surgery. You will do operative reduction of the fracture, closed or open, and pinning. The pulses and the perfusion is usually restored in about 53 to 70 percent of patients. And if the pulses and the perfusion did not restore, then you will do immediate open vascular exploration. The chance of brachial artery injury is as high as 80 percent. If you do an open exploration and reduction, you will do 4 to 5 cm transverse anterior incision in the anticubital flexion crease. Then you will do decompression of the artery and repair of the artery with reverse vein graft. How about the pulseless will perfuse the hand? If the hand is pink and pulseless, this is usually due to transient brachial artery spasm, or it may be due to brachial artery injury with the distal perfusion maintained by rich collateral circulation at the elbow. You may increase the ambient temperature in the operating room and apply a topical agent such as lidocaine or popovirin, which allows resolution of the vasospasm and restoration of the distal arterial flow. The treatment of a pulseless pink hand is controversial, but you will do close reduction plus pinning in addition to 24 to 48 hours of inpatient observation. You got to reduce the fracture urgently and destabilize it, in addition to observation of the patient. If the perfusion is compromised during this period of observation, emergency return to the operating room for vascular exploration and possibly reconstruction is indicated. The majority of patients will have restored pulses. Close monitoring during this observation period for loss of perfusion, agitation, anxiety, or for increased pain or an increased energetic requirement. The patient may have to go back to the operating room for compartment release or for vascular surgery. Another alternative is to do immediate surgical exploration for the concern of later on ischemia or ischemic changes. Pre-reduction angiography is not recommended. You don't need to do angiography or an ultrasound because this increases the ischemic time to the limb and it delays the definitive treatment. Some research shows that vascular injury in 70% of perfused pulseless limbs. The patient may suffer ischemic fibrosis of the affected limb later on. Here is a table that should help you in treating subracondylar humeral fracture with pulseless hand. Start with the pulseless hand. Is it well perfused hand? Then you do close reduction and surgery. The surgery is for pinning and reassess the vascular status. Usually, you observe the patient from 24 to 48 hours, but if the circulation 
is bad or got worse, then you will get a vascular consult. You may also get the vascular consult during the observation if the vascular status got worse. If the patient's hand is pulseless and poorly perfused, you will do emergency surgery for reduction and fixation of the fracture. And if the hand continue to be pulseless and poorly perfused after the reduction and the fixation, then you will need the vascular surgeon. Thank you very much. I hope that was helpful.